Coming up on Garden Talk. Stable businesses, they're looking for people with actual experience and education at a collegiate level. Obviously, you have full control. It's done by yourself. You can kind of make your, your standard operating procedures to match your time schedule and what you're doing. When you have, you know, 20, 30, 50 lights in a room, it makes a big difference compared to two lights in a home grow. Wet trimmed product looks really great for photography. So if you like to take pictures of it to show off for your Instagram, wet trimming is kind of a fun way to go. In horticulture, there's usually more than one way to get to your end product. There's a lot of different methodologies to grow your end product. And just because you're good at doing it one way in your home grow does not mean you can come into someone else's horticulture facility and change what they're doing. What's up, everybody? Few that don't know me, my name is Chris, a.k.a. Mr. Grow It, and you're tuned into the Garden Talk podcast. This episode number 56. In this episode, I interview Envy Closet Med Grower. He has been gardening for 10 years, and he grows a variety of plants, such as tomatoes, peppers, cacti, medicinal varieties, house plants, and more. He started as a home grower, and then worked his way up into working in commercial facilities. And that's what we're going to get into today, from home growing to commercial growing. Thanks to all of you who support this podcast or Patreon. If you'd like to support, you can do so by going to patreon.com slash mrgrowit. Before we get into it, I want to acknowledge that one of my goals for this podcast is to bring zero cost for information about gardening, all plants, to the general public. That being said, I'd like to thank the sponsors of today's episode who helped make that goal possible. Big shout out to Dutch Pro for sponsoring this podcast. Dutch Pro is a plant fertilizer company that has been around for over 30 years. They have base nutrients and they also have additives such as PK boosters, root stimulators, CalMag, silica, a nutrient optimizer, and a foiler feed. They also have pH regulators to help ensure that the nutrients can be uptaken properly. I will leave a link to Dutch Pro's Amazon store down in the description section below and you can use coupon code mrgrow 10 dp for a discount on their products. Thanks to Spider Farmer for being a sponsor. A new grow light they released here in 2022 is the SE1000W. This was designed specifically for those of you who run CO2 in your grow space and really want to maximize the light intensity. It has a 10 bar design for an even light spread, pulls 1000 watts from the wall, and comes in at 2.9 micromoles per joule efficacy. The recommended coverage area is 4 feet by 4 feet or 5 feet by 5 feet. Use discount code MrGrowIt5 to save on all Spider Farmer products, and I'll leave a link in the video description section below. A big supporter of this podcast is AC Infinity. They sponsor this podcast, and I use their products. AC Infinity now has gardening tools and accessories, such as heavy-duty fabric grow pots, trimmers, grow room glasses, drying racks, plant ties, and trellis nets. They also have all of the equipment needed for a ventilation system. I will leave a link to AC Infinity down in the description section below, and you can use discount code MrGrowIt during checkout for a discount on their products. And we are back. Welcome to the Garden Talk Podcast. Today I am joined with Envy Closet Med Grower. How are you doing today? I'm doing great, Chris. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm excited to be on the podcast. I'm excited to have some topics to talk about, and I think it's a, it's a blessing to be on here talking with you, so I'm ready to get started. Yeah, we've been friends for several years now. You were on my Twitch live stream not too long ago, and uh, we had a really great conversation about a bunch of different topics, and uh, yeah. I figured it would be good to have you on here, Garden Talk, so we can speak specifically about gardening, you know, one of your one of your specialties for sure. Yep. So what I want to get into on this episode is home growing to commercial growing. So there are so many people out there that are home growers right now that their dream is to eventually work in a commercial facility, right? So, you know, whether they live in a legal state and there are already facilities open and they want to get their foot in the door there, or maybe they're in a non-legal state that's going to turn to be legal and they want to be all prepared and ready to go for when it does become legal so they can get into the industry on that avenue. And you've done that. You've gone from home yes. growing to commercial growing. So I thought you'd be a great person to have on this show today. For the record, you were the one that came up with the topic for this one so props to you for that one thanks yeah i uh you know some of my background i started off more or less as a home grower i won multiple cups home growing and uh you know i really 
care and try to try to stay with the home growing community as as it relates to obviously many different plants and gardening but particularly hemp so i i did a lot of that for many years and then i've also managed facilities i've managed uh you know both facilities and i've helped consult for different facilities and my next project actually is a large hemp grow in tennessee that is all complete indoor facility managed commercial projects as well as home grow projects at a very high level and i think think it would be a good topic we could get into and talk about some of the differences between how you would manage a home grow and how you would either be an employee and or manage a commercial grow and what things you need to look for in that so that's going to be good. It's going to be really good. Before we get too deep into it, though, you gave us a little bit of an introduction. Can you do a full-blown introduction? Uh, there's a lot of things to be said about you, for sure. But tell us a little bit about yourself and kind of how you got into gardening. Yes. I uh, Well, I got into gardening when I was young, it, in vegetable gardening anyways. My mom always liked to have a vegetable garden out back of our house in Michigan. As I got older, I got more into hemp medical plant production and uh did a lot of that when I was younger. Then I went eventually moved to Nevada, which was a legal state for medicinal plants, and got into home growing with a with a license to home grow there. Eventually, won multiple different cup awards and and progressed my YouTube channel for home growing with intents and closets and various things along those lines. So. From there, I progressed into helping manage uh, grow stores and horticulture stores. So I've sold a lot of horticulture equipment, made a lot of deals and, and contacts with various different horticulture companies, and uh, progressed from there to actually managing uh, horticulture facilities. Incredible. So living the dream, living a lot of people's dreams, which is uh, working in that commercial environment. So what, uh, you know, kind of taking a step back and, and talking about qualifications, right? Not anybody can just walk in off the street and apply to some of these places. You have to have qualifications, right, in order to yes. begin. So what qualifications should folks have before applying to a commercial facility? Well, it honestly all depends on what you're trying to get into. Some of the entry-level positions, you really don't need a whole lot of, of qualifications. If you just want to be a basic trimmer, for instance, a lot of times they will hire you on with absolutely zero experience because it's kind of tedious work and it's entry-level to get you in the business. Um, other entry-level positions might be like a basic garden helper where you're just going through and plucking leaves and doing that sort of thing. You know, you're not usually in charge of any watering or in charge of too much as far as, you know, the irrigation or fertigation of your crops. And some of those, again, you can get in with just basic cultivation knowledge, basic plant knowledge, a good work history in other fields. Obviously, no matter what you're getting hired for, someone's going to want to make sure you show up to work on time, you're credible, you get along with your employees you know all those things that are that are general amongst any job field and uh, that's more or less how you get into it a lot for the entry level positions it doesn't have as much to do with having a ton of experience it has to do with being a good employee that they're able to train to do the function they need now as you get up from there there's also a lot of mid-level jobs you know like specialty horticulture jobs like a propagator or a room supervisor and some other things like that those type of jobs usually you want to have some little more advanced knowledge of horticulture um, you're also going to want usually one or two years experience either as a mid or entry level employee already in these type of facilities so that way they know you have some experience in what you're doing and uh, once you get to that point it's important that you at least have some employee management experience too if you're managing a room and have employees underneath you they want to make sure you're you're a good fit to deal with other employees so a lot of that is more hr related and a lot less horticulture related stuff but you got to have those skills in order to progress into higher level positions within these horticulture facilities. Um, progressing up from that, you can get jobs like lead cultivator and you know lead grower, master grower. It's, it goes by various different names depending on the facility. But a lot of times in those, they really do ask that you have five plus years experience within a horticulture facility. You also, by this point, should have some secondary school or college experience in horticulture agriculture or botany somewhere within a related field so they know you're also classically trained with science on how plants work and that's that's usually pretty important by the time you get to that uh 
that higher end of things. And obviously you're going to need multiple years of employee management at that point, you know, because you're going to have teams underneath you, not only just employees, but also supervisors and you need to take care of your entire team. So again, once you, the higher you go up in these ranks, um, employee management becomes very important as well as obviously as a lead cultivator, you need both advanced to expert level experience and knowledge in horticulture itself. So that's what that is. And then the, the last kind of section I got here is support jobs. A lot of the larger cultivation facilities don't only have cultivation based jobs. There's also a front desk slash intake clerks a lot of times that help, you know, take the phone calls for the facilities, take in the orders that, that the cultivator orders in for supplies and, you know, various different things like that. There's commercial sales managers, which are another more high end job where they're actually in charge of selling the products that you're those business related relationships. And obviously there's also data specialists. Sometimes there's, uh, like in the medical field, there's metric system in many different states that's required and you need a data track of everything. And they usually work very close along with the commercial cultivator in order to make sure everything stays on track and everything is up to regulation based on the state you're in. So, and those jobs can vary on what you need to get into those positions. A lot of times, you know, front desk clerk, you usually need other front desk experience and that sort of thing. If you're going to be a data specialist, they kind of want you to have some knowledge of metric and some knowledge of how horticulture facilities run. You know, if you're a commercial sales manager, you're going to want to have multiple years experience and possibly degrees in sales and working for different sales because it's a higher end position that usually pays well. So that's, that's kind of the four different facility, your entry level, mid level, your lead jobs, you know, production managers and such, and then your support job. So. So lots of different areas that you can kind of get into. I think generally speaking, a lot of folks think that master grower is kind of the end goal and in, in running a facility, you know, kind of on the floor dealing with the plants directly is one of the main options that I think a lot of people go for. But yeah, definitely starting out from the bottom and kind of working your way up into one of those positions is, is certainly a possibility. But I feel like going right into one of those high level positions that you mentioned, having an education, you know, yes, they're going to yes. look for that, right? They, they want you to have some sort of either a bachelor's degree or doctorate degree or, or something um, that relates specifically to cultivation. Right? Yes, and I don't mean to interrupt, but yes, you are 100% right. And that's mainly the change in the job market over the t last 10 years, as a lot of states have gotten medical programs and become more open to growing medical plants. They've they used to take on cultivators from say the black market that just knew what they were doing. As things progress more into more into stable businesses, they're looking for people with actual experience and education at a collegiate level. That makes sense. I remember back in 2016 when this state just went wreck, we're in Nevada, uh, you were in there yes. as well. And they just started bringing on dispensaries, right? Dispensaries just launched in 2016 and cultivation facilities were just opening up. And I applied back then because that's something I wanted to do. And man, it was so, I couldn't even get a response back. It was like, it was like the market was flooded. And what I was told by insiders is that you have to know somebody in order to really get your, your resume pushed up to the people who are doing the, the hiring aspect of it. And it can be difficult to find those people, you know? So, uh, you know, I ended up eventually giving up and just, <laughs> and just continue on my home growing and doing the media side of things. But how would you recommend folks actually go about applying to these commercial facilities so they don't run into these dead ends? Well, like you said, it's, it's a, or like we were briefly talking about, it's kind of a different setup now than it was five to 10 years ago. Five to 10 years ago, you very much had to know someone, have the in, get, get your name in someone's ear. Nowadays, it's run a lot more like most corporate businesses. A lot of times you can fill out online applications for different positions. Um, if you can't find an easy way to apply for a facility that's near you and you know what's there, you know, go look at their website, go look at their social medias and ask them how you can, how you can apply for these positions. Positions. Try to be outgoing with the fact that you do want to work for them. Um, yeah, and like I said, sometimes sometimes it can be hard to find these particular places, so you might have to directly go out and search 
you know, for, for their direct websites. They're not always on Indeed or some of these bigger job engines. Now, sometimes they are. Again, this is a larger commercial operations nowadays, and they do very much, many of them post to Indeed. So it all depends on the facility you're looking looking towards. It depends on on how they're doing their hiring. But a lot of times nowadays, this day and age, you can find online applications or, or websites linking to these different horticulture companies that you can then apply for. Okay, that makes sense. Let's get into the home growing versus commercial growing side of things. And I wanna go through some of the individual processes or different stages of growth and kind of what home growing entails versus what being in a commercial facility entails. You know, let's be honest here. Home growing is a small side mm-hmm. of things. Some of those processes that are done just aren't able to be scaled up to a large amount of plants, yes. right? So I think there's some some big differences throughout growing from, from home to commercial growing. And you've worked in the facilities before, so you can definitely give us some insight on the differences. So let's start with, you know, starting from the beginning, propagation and, and seedlings. What differences would you say would take place between home growing and commercial growing when it comes to propagation and seedlings? We can get into that. First of all, we'll start on the home growing side. Obviously, you have full control. It's done by yourself. You can kind of make your your standard operating procedures to match your time schedule and what you're doing. Um, also, like you said, it's you have a lot more availability to pop seeds on a lower level. When you're working on a commercial system, you want the consistency of having consistent crops and, and consistent output of your product. And by popping seeds and having different features, variables that may in the end cost your company money so or cost your company in less revenue you know it's kind of looked at the same in the economic world if you're not maximizing your revenue you're losing money when you look at it from an economics point so a lot of times in facilities you have much less variables which means much less seed popping also, when it gets to cloning, um, sometimes you use slightly different equipment because let's face it, if you have two lights or less, you're not usually going to need a full tray of 50 clones. So a lot of times as a home grower, I'd get inch and a half pre-wrapped Rockwell blocks, break off what I need and clone six or 10 or 12 plants at a time. Whereas in a commercial facility, chances are you're going to need hundreds, if not thousands of plants for your next cycle. So everything's done on Rockwell sheets in a 1020 tray for the most part, or, you know, it's, it's done a lot more consistently over a larger scale. It's not made to match your size. It's made to, it's made to match what you need going next in the production line. So again, a lot of times I'll use like inch and a half or two inch, you know, 50 cell rock wall sheets in a 1020 tray as compared to the individual wrapped cubes, because then I can just clone in groups of 50. And when I need a thousand clones, I might clone, you know, 1050 clones and then take the best thousand and run those for my next run. As compared to at a home grow, if I need 12 clones, I'm not going to use a rock wall sheet. I'm going to just take those individual clones and take what I need. So some of the actual procedure can slightly change and some of the equipment can slightly change. But then on top of that, also propagation in a facility is usually done in a propagation room or in the mother room and you're able to maintain higher humidities throughout the entire environment. A lot of times in home grows, people just don't invest in their propagation area the same they would in their flower area. So it's usually, you know, an extra closet space or I got an extra light over here in the corner of my room and you got to spray your clones a lot more to keep the humidity up on them if you're in a dry area and that sort of thing. Whereas in a facility, your humidity is on point because you have bought it is. So it's, you know, there's a little less of the spraying of the clones, a little more consistent procedure. Let's get deeper into the environment because you, you mentioned that, you know, temperature, relative humidity, CO2, airflow, air exchange, all of those things, all of those things are going to be somewhat similar, but there's a lot of differences in how they're controlled from home growing versus commercial growing. For example, you know, a dehumidifier is going to be a lot smaller in a home grow, you know, and say a bedroom, for example, with a couple tents, it's going to be a lot smaller than it would be in a commercial facility where they have this massive room, you know, so I, I, I imagine the equipment to be a lot bigger, maybe multiple mm-hmm. pieces of equipment controlling things. Can you talk just about environment differences between home growing and commercial growing? 
Yeah, well, of course, like you said, there, there's definitely going to be inconsistencies based on the size of equipment, but a lot of your parameters are still going to, you're going to try to keep the parameters somewhat the same. Usually when you have that larger equipment and you have a, a better sealed position in a, in a facility, you have less variation in what's going on, so you can be more consistent both with your temperatures, humidities, that sort of thing. Also, with home grows, many, many times, you're not running CO2. I know some of you guys are, but the majority of home growers aren't running ex excessive CO2. And they're cycling air from their room out of their room. Or, for instance, with tent grows, you, you condition the room and then cycle air through the tent. Whereas in a facility, it's more about conditioning your grow space and making sure it's consistent throughout the entire grow space. So... Um, yeah, a lot bigger equipment, um, usually almost always CO2 injected on a commercial level. There's, I haven't been in indoor facilities without CO2 because it is that much of a benefit to your production. But as a home grower, a tent grower, it's really hard to get those elevated levels, and that can sometimes lead to you needing slightly less light, um, you running slightly less or less strength fertilizer, lower EC fertilizer, because you don't have the carbon to increase that photosynthetic rate. Whereas in a facility with the CO2, you would run things a little more to the max to try to get your max production out of it. Commercial air handlers have HEPA filtration and things built into them, so it can help clean the air column of molds and mildews and things like that. Whereas a lot of home grow ACs, you know, the dual ducted ACs and window ACs and even small mini splits, you're not gonna have that type of filtration in there so it's it's about controlling those variables on a larger scale to make sure you don't have any loss of production whereas on a small scale it's about doing things that fit around your lifestyle so you you know sometimes have to work around work schedules and things like that and that can change when you're timing your lights of the day and all sorts of things so your environment can be a lot more variable in a home grow I find than commercial because there's money riding on the commercial not just your personal, but there's money riding for investors that do not take no returns as an option. So it, everything has to be consistent and run to the facility's SOP when it comes into that. Also, cleanliness uh, can be slightly differently. You know, there's times when I'd be a little lazy in my home grows, you know, I, I like back to propagation. I might cut clones with the same scissors on all four of my strains in my home grow. If you're in a large commercial facility and you're cutting thousands of clones, you better keep some alcohol near you to keep those scissors clean. You don't want to be transferring any contaminant that might be on one plant to a thousand plants. That can make a huge issue. So, you know, that those are the type of environmental is, uh, differences between the two and uh, I guess the last thing is is in commercial you're not wasting space on conditioning it's not like I said with tent grows where you condition a room then cycle it through no if you're conditioning a room you better have plants in that room that's one of your biggest expenses outside of labor so you better better make sure you're pushing it as best as you can definitely some good call outs there to significant differences when it comes to home growing versus commercial facility for for those reasons you mentioned i can't imagine any commercial facilities using those tme naturals canisters <laughs> shaking them up and putting them all around your, your production <laughs> cost per up. unit would be through the roof if you're using a yeast and sugar based co2 release um you yeah in <laughs> in fact there's another difference for you too a lot of home grows that do run co2 are usually 50 pound bottles of co2 and that sort of thing and once you scale up into a commercial facility that's 5,000 square foot or bigger a lot of times they switch over to um, liquid co2 tanks and then inject in that way so you can have you know large 500 gallon liquid co2 tanks you know or, or compressed co2 tanks that hold a lot more and then it's piped in through your whole facility instead of being a bottle in a corner being released through a regulator so there's, you know, quite, like you said, quite a bit of differences on equipment in both their size, scale, and capabilities. Yeah, I was going to ask about the, the CO2 change. I'm glad you got into that. But now, airflow and air exchange is also kind of the important piece. Kind of touched on that a, a little bit. On a home grow, you talked about air exchange, you know, having a tent uh, versus grow room. They have fans of the commercial facility. There are fans all around the facility, right? And the air exchange is yes. another thing, right? Having um, air being exhausted. Sometimes I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, from multiple areas, not just one area being exhausted from. How do typically they go about, uh, you know, air flow and air exchange in a commercial facility? 
Well, a lot of times air exchange is actually less than a non-CO2 home grow because you're trying to maintain keeping the CO2 in your environment. Now, uh, based on some regulations, at least I know for a fact it is in Nevada, you need to have a CO2 purge just in case something breaks and it gets above certain levels, it'll automatically pump the CO2 out of your room as a safety regulation. That's something you would never have on a home grow. You would just look at your monitor when you walk in. If the number's too high, turn off your CO2 and get the hell out. You know, <laughs> whereas in a in a facility, you need to have these regulations in place to protect your employees. So a lot of times you have, you know, CO2 purging units, which are could be a fan on a CO2 controller, where if it gets above say five or ten thousand ppm's, whatever your state regulation is, it'll automatically dump all air out of your room from within two feet of the ground. And that way it'll pull all the heavier CO2 from the bottom of the room out and everything will start to in there and, and maintenance your equipment to make sure that doesn't happen. And again, with the home grow, that's, that's not something you would have going on. And then also in the commercial facility, like I said, you'd have less air exchange, so you're not wasting your CO2 for the most part. There are some facilities set up to do a night dump where they dump all the air out of their environment at night, replace it at night, and then when the lights kick back on, they'll re-release more CO2. But as for CO2 efficiency and cost efficiency, that's usually not the best way to do it, in my opinion. I would keep it more or less not dumping co2 you can get a little bit more oxygen exchange just from employees coming in and out the doors and then maintain as much co2 in the room as possible with it sealed and less exchange now airflow which is the second thing you had kind of brought up there is also a little different in a facility because when you have such big rooms you need to make sure the temperature in this corner of the room this corner of the room the middle of the room the front is consistent within a degree or two otherwise you're going to have very inconsistent canopies growth uh, growth situations and possibly chances for contamination if humidity you got pockets of humidity and such so there's again a lot bigger equipment used you know there's a company called Schaefer that makes fans that can launch air in quite a quite a distance that's really useful there's other other fan technologies that actually mount on the ceiling and pull air up and cycle it through the room and that'll really help with your consistency of making evenly dispersed amongst your room when you have you know 20 30 50 lights in a room it makes a big difference compared to two lights in a home grow okay so definitely some some major differences there for sure let's get into the vegetative stage uh, for a little bit here lots of things that home growers do that really aren't done in the commercial facility side of things you know maybe we should start with kind of watering and feeding right when you're dealing with hundreds thousands of plants i don't think a lot of commercial facilities do hand watering right they're on some sort of automated machine fertilizer you know the dosatron or something like that Can you talk to us about the differences between you know um, fertilizing and watering yeah of course and and there is quite a few different companies that uh that deal with different fertigation and irrigation equipment but on a home grow scale it's just not worth buying this equipment like like you said dosatron some dosatrons can be a couple thousand dollars just for a, a single peristolic pump and a controller you know and if you have a too light home grow it's not necessarily worth your investment to throw in that much money or say like an argus fertigation system can cost thirty fifty thousand dollars or more they have touch screen controls for all you you're not going to need that at a home grow you're just never going to get your your value back from buying a 50 piece of equipment whereas a facility that's 10,000 square foot or more they can probably get their money back on that fifty thousand uh, dollar investment so you're right a lot of times home grows um there's a lot of hand watering majority of the time in veg in order to get things to size just because it's it's also harder to put in irrigation when you're trying to cycle things on a smaller level if you got two plants that are young and veg, two plants that are old and veg, they're going to be drinking completely differently, and it's almost easier to hand water at that point. But if you have 500 plants on these five rows and 500 plants on these five rows, you can set up fertigation equipment to feed those 500 how you want, feed those 500 how you want, and then you end up with a, not a more consistent, but a, a more more efficient plan of feeding both in labor cost because you got to remember commercial facilities one of your highest costs is labor costs if you're hand watering you're going to need twice as many employees as if you're using irrigation equipment 
So that that is a huge difference in the vegetative section. Another big uh, difference is the amount of experimentation you can do. And like I mentioned earlier, as a home grower, you can pop different seeds, you can run different strains, you can do a lot of different things to excite yourself about your horticulture experience. When you're in a facility, you need to follow the SLPs. Whatever the lead grower, whatever who's ever in charge of that, they set up those SLPs for a reason. They know what they're doing most of the time. Most of the time. But they, uh, <laughs> on top of that, they, they set it up in a way so that way it works for their production techniques. And when in horticulture, there's usually more than one way to get to your end product. There's a lot of different methodologies to grow your end product. And just because you're good at doing it one way in your home grow does not mean you can come into someone else's horticulture facility and change what they're doing that could very much change the outcome and the time schedules of what they have going on. And that is a very big no-no. So once you get into uh, uh, facilities, again, you're using larger irrigation systems. Consistency is a key there. You want to consistently grow well. Oh, my camera's getting fuzzy. There it goes. But uh, you uh, consistently want to stay to these schedules because you're on very strict time schedules on when you need these plants ready for their next stage of growth. Whereas at a home grower, if you want to let it grow a week longer and let your plant and flower finish a week later, you can kind of get away with that. If you try to do that in a commercial facility, that week could be thousands of dollars worth of production cost for no harvest now. Problem to the investors and the money people that are paying your salary. So... That's that's kind of the differences in the vegetative system. Um, your time schedule is super important. You're not experimenting. You're doing what's needed to get these plants to the next stage based on the SLPs. And you're usually involving irrigation systems as compared to hand watering once you scale up to larger size facilities. I imagine plant training, which is uh, often done in the vegetative stage, is going to be a lot different too, right? You mentioned labor, how labor can be significantly more when it comes to hand watering. Well, if you're in a cultivation facility and you want people to do defoliation or lollipopping or, you know, low stress training or any type of these, these hands-on training techniques, it's going to be more labor cost. So I imagine that they cut back a little bit there compared to what home growers are doing to their plants. Talk to us about the differences with plant training. Of course. And uh, uh, with that respect, some of that plant training is still done because it's very important. A lot of defoliation and lollipop is still done on a commercial scale because you need that airflow for your IPM prevention to help prevent mold growth and mildew growth and things like that. So a lot of those techniques are still used and that's just a labor cost, you know, management's going to have to endure. But you're also right about the fact that there's a lot less LST, there's a lot less topping because, and this is a regulation issue, most home grows for medical plants anyways are regulated to how many plants they can grow so if you need x amount of product out of your medical plant but you're only allowed six flowering plants you might want a much bigger plant that takes more topping and training and lst and a much longer veg time in order to get your desired result whereas in a facility we're really trying to minimize the amount of veg time we have and if we need to fill more plant canopy space we will add more plants in and it's actually less labor cost to put more plants per area than it is to grow a much bigger plant. I know you have another episode that was that was very good about why you grow smaller plants from a year or so ago on this podcast. It's one of your more popular episodes. You guys should check that one out too when you're done with this one. But um, yeah, that's that's very much why the the production cost and the regulations on home growers lead re- lead home growers to grow larger plants in most areas. Um, whereas commercially we fill it with more plants that are in the same size root zone, same consistent size canopies. So that way we can match it to our irrigation systems and all our inputs and everything grows evenly. Um, yeah. And yeah, I think that's all the notes I have on that one. That's, there's, that's the main difference is those regulation differences and, and the fact that home growers sometimes need to grow larger plants. You touched upon IPM, and I want to circle back around to that and get a little bit deeper into IPM because, you know, it's a a much larger scale with commercial facilities Mm -hmm. compared to home grow, right? I mean, a typical home grower is going to oftentimes just use a small 48-ounce hand sprayer and spray their plants, uh, you know, with that or use a chapin, a two-gallon chapin or something like that. Yep, and I have some of those myself. (laughs) 
<laughs> yeah, when you're on the commercial facility side of things, when you're dealing with more plants, you know, 50, 100 plants, thousands of plants, often see people go to like the backpack style ones, mm -hmm. which spray further, uh, you know, more of a, a mist compared to some of these hand sprayers. Can you talk to us about the differences with, you know, yeah. IPM and, and spraying and all that stuff? Yeah, and like you said, you briefly touched on it, as with everything else, your equipment scales up with the size you're growing. In fact, even if you look at a horticulture perspective from, say, large-scale greenhouses, production greenhouses for cut flowers and things like that, they have giant booms that go through their whole greenhouse and, and can fertigate and or spray pesticides just just to cover that much area without needing the labor costs involved. And at small to mid-scale commercial facilities, like you said, a lot of times you're using a five-gallon backpack sprayer because otherwise if you're mixing up a gallon, half gallon at a time, you're going to be mixing all day and trying to spray as compared to getting your work done and continuing on to the next path. Uh, the other thing I need to uh, mention with that is as a home grower you're not limited in what you can use as long as you're growing safely you're using things that are not carcinogenic you're using things that have low toxicity and a uh, low half-life so it can break down quickly you're pretty much open to use whatever you want on your home garden now the regulations for facilities are twofold there are agriculture regulations for pest management and pest application in almost every state and federally that you have to follow so a lot Lot of your IPM specialists inside your facilities will actually need uh, to be regulated by the state and they'll actually have to take classes and be certified in order to apply pesticides. On top of that, within the medical plant market, there's also direct regulations by those states that have legalized the medical plant. So almost every legal state has their own set of regulations on which pesticides you can use, which pesticides you cannot use. You know, for instance, there's a, a, a strong, it's fairly toxic pesticide for killing water molds called metalaxyl. In almost every medical state, you cannot use that product. In Nevada, you can. So it has a long half-life, it's toxic, but it's not carcinogenic. Nevada, you can. Other states, you can't. And as long as you use it based on what the label says, so that way you're following the federal regulations, then you can use it in a facility in Nevada. You use that same product on a facility in California. So you got to know your state-by-state -state regulations as well as your federal regulations on who can apply pesticides and what type of certifications they need before they are allowed to do that legally. So you got to have a lot of knowledge in regards to that because I'm sure it gets pretty muddy going from state to state. The impact is, can be astronomical, right? If you're spraying the wrong thing on there, you send that crop out for testing, all of a sudden it fails tests and your entire crop is wiped out and you can't put that product on the shelf. Yes. And then you're going to have some very mad investors, very, very mad investors. A lot of times you, if you lose more than 2% of your crop throughout the year, your investors are not going to be too happy. If you break the 5% mark and fail your rate, like you, they're probably looking for a different cultivator. So There's a lot on the line for sure. Flowering stage. Let's get into the differences between home growing and commercial growing within the flower stage. Yeah, uh, briefly, this one is is kind of kind of repetitive of some of the other things. Again, you you need to make as a home grower, you make a cultivation plan that works for your schedule. A lot of other times, you have a job, you have other things going on in your life, you have a family, you need to maintain that schedule. A large facility, on the other hand, might just run two or three shifts of employees, and it's not about, oh, the lights have to be on now because I can work on it. It's we set up the lights based on what's most efficient for our facility, and the employees work around that schedule. So it's a little backwards to those regards. Um, also, in a home grow, a lot of times you can run your plants as long as you need to get them to finish to senescence the way you want. In a cultivation facility, timing is everything. If you are running a nine-week flower room, when it's day 63, you are harvesting, whether that plant needs two or three more days or not. That's just the way it is, because within a day or two, you have veg plants that have to be in that location. And if you over-veg your veg plants, now they're sitting longer in veg, and that's a waste of resources and money spent in the previous cycle. So again, timing is everything commercially. Whereas you can kind of... Work things around a little bit to your liking and to your schedule as a home grower. And then uh, secondly, um, consistency, consistency, consistency. 
follow the standard operating procedures. The lead growers are put there for a reason. They have, again, like I said earlier, if the, you need to follow the procedure they have to grow. There's many different ways to grow a healthy plant. They have a set up plan. They were put in there for a reason. So if you're a mid to entry level employee, just follow what they're saying. Even if you have a different idea on how to do it, bring that up in a question form to the lead grower, bring that up later, but do the work they tell you to at that time, even if it's inconsistent with your own knowledge. Yeah, there, there's so much on the line for sure throughout the, the entire grow, really. You know, it makes me wonder, you had mentioned being on a, a set schedule and how they're harvesting flowers even when they might not they might need a little bit more time, right? So I imagine how many facilities are harvesting early to where like its potency isn't at its full potential and potentially, you know, clear trichomes, for example, where it's, you know, the effect doesn't last as long or it's a, you know, different effect than what the, that cultivar to truly brings out. And to work around that, a lot of times the facilities work plants that match their facility. If you have a plant that needs 10 weeks to flower and it, it seems to grow in someone else's facility, great. But in your facility seems a little bit slowed down and you have a nine week or eight week flower schedule, you're cutting that plant out of the lineup after one run of it and switching to something that grows properly in your environment. Whereas a home grower, like I said, you might just give it the extra week because you like that effect. You like that plant. You're not doing that on a commercial level. It's about making sure those ends meet for your investors. So you, you have to make those tough decisions that are a, a little bit tougher in this regard in a cultivation facility than what they would be as a home grower. Now, harvesting, getting a little bit deeper into that, you had, you know mentioned that if they're on a strict schedule, they need to do it at a certain time. But how about like physical process of, of harvesting? It varies quite a bit from home grow to mm -hmm. commercial facility. Can you speak on that a little bit? Yeah, as, as a home grower, you more or less harvest when it's the end of senescin. So like I said, you're, you can be growing different plants and you do it based on when you want. We already kind of touched on that. But uh, um, yeah, you also have to match your dry space. So a lot of home growers don't necessarily have dedicated dry rooms and dedicated cure rooms like what you would have in a facility. So if your dry room is half full and these plants that you harvested a week ago still need a few more days to finish leave your other plant and flower a few days finish those ones trim them up then harvest just so you can cycle things through because again kind of like propagation usually your dry room and your propagation as a home grower are kind of your last thought you think about your flower room first your bedroom second everything else how can i kind of build it around in a cultivation facility there is rooms dedicated to drying on top of that, as an indoor facility, you also are going to pretty much always have humidifiers and dehumidifiers in that room because the first few days after you harvest and you have a room full of, of medical plants, it's going to release a lot of water and you're going to need a dehu to keep it down. After three to five days or so, the water really slows down a lot and in some situations you can end up a little too dry and you might actually need a humidifier in that room to keep you at that perfect consistency. Whereas a home grow, you're more or less tailoring it, tailoring it around your climate. When I lived in Nevada, I would need a humidifier. If you live in Florida, you would need a dehumidifier, but you probably won't need both. You can get it close and do pretty decent. Um, difference is, is a lot more control over what you're doing. And then also in a facility, your harvest is usually done by a harvest team. So they're clearing a whole room at one time and filling their dry room. Whereas, like I said, in a home grow, you kind of tailor it to based on how much room you have, when your plants are ready, and you kind of muck around your schedule in order to get the best product you want. Timing is money in a commercial facility, and you cannot do that. It's about having a team that can efficiently de-leaf and harvest these plants, get them the way you can get out of cleaning that room, so that way within 24 to 48 hours you have new plants in that room. Whenever I'm drying at home, I always get like a little jealous. I always think about like how it is a commercial facility and how much easier it probably is having a dedicated drying room with controls for temperature yes. and humidity. Because I, you know, it's not easy to to control that those aspects uh, depending on you know the climate you live. And like you mentioned, uh, where where in Nevada where I live, it's very dry. So I'm always having a humidifier. And oftentimes I just dry in my grow tent and. There is variation in the, you know, the temperature and humidity. You know, I don't really have a air conditioner uh, at all times, you know, in, a, in my drying room or, or grow room to where I can get a low 
temperature. Uh, for example, a lot of people go after like 60, yes. the 60, 60 rule, right? 60% humidity, yeah. 60 degree Fahrenheit. Oftentimes I can't get that low as far as the temperature, you know, I'm at yeah. 65, sometimes even 70. And, and you know, the, the higher the temperatures get, the more yeah. terpenes are, are being evaporated. You're losing that. So I do get jealous not being able to have yes, a, uh, a steady temperature and humidity when drying in particular, because getting down to those, I feel like if you have a dedicated drying room, like in a cultivation facility, it's much easier to conserve those terpenes and, and control that drying time than it is, you know, at home. I, I agree with everything you said there. That is very much the truth. Trimming. So at Home Grow, you have the opportunity to either wet trim or dry trim. People have preferences. Mm -hmm. Some people like to do a wet trim. Some people like to do a dry trim. Oftentimes, nine times out of ten, they're using hand trimmers. You know, so they're, they're spending the time to have a nice manicure buds or they have, you know, there are small home trimmers like those bowl trimmers that you can use. I think those yeah. are halfway decent. But on a commercial facility, some facilities, from my understanding, still do want to do the hand trimming. But oftentimes they're doing, yes. they have large trim machines now, which are handling pounds mm -hmm. at a time. Can you talk to us about trimming, kind of the differences, yes. home grow versus cultivation? Yeah. Well, you, you kind of went into the, some of the basics of it. The majority of home grow is almost always completely hand trim from the larf nugs all the way up to your top buds. It's as much hand trimmed as possible because people don't want to invest in the machines for small scale. Um, when you get into a facility, usually it's either machine trim or a mix of machine and hand trim. They'll take the top quality buds, have those on a trim team hand trimmed, and then all the mids that are still sellable, they'll usually run through a machine and have that as a different quality of product and or sometimes mixed into the top end batch depending on how it looks. But for the most part, you're right. There is a massive difference in equipment as there has been through every bit of this podcast so far. Um, and when you're when you're talking about trimming also when you're trimming at home the majority of your smoke most of the time the majority of of the product you're making is your own personal product so you can be a little sloppy with your trimming you don't you can leave a crow's feet here and there and you know under trim some stuff if it has really sugary trim leaf on it and you're fine with that because you you know it's for you anyways who cares when you're in a commercial facility that product is not yours that product is going to a consumer some consumers are more picky than most of you if they see a crow's feed on there they're going to be on their instagram complaining about your facility so you need to trim very tight very cleanly if you are a trimmer for a facility there is no leave a little bit because it's sugary it's make that look as best as possible so that way you have the best of bag appeal and you can leave the best impression on your consumers for your facility um also like you said wet versus dry trimming a lot of home growers and again this is based on climate if if you have a, a much drier area you might want to dry trim anyway so that way you have some sugar leaf protecting your product and it'll slow down the actual evaporation rate out of it and you can get a little longer dry out of it whereas if you're again in a much more humid area you might want to speed that up a little bit because you're having a hard time keeping your humidity below 60 percent so it might be more beneficial for you to wet trim um, whereas in a facility where you have everything set and perfect it's almost always dry trimmed First of all, the majority of machine trimming equipment works off of dry trimming, not wet trimming. So in order to use the machines, almost always you need a dried product. Not always. There's a few that wet trim, but most of them dry trim. And then on top of that, it's, uh, it's about the evaporation of terpenes and terpene release. If you have your environment perfect, and then you can kind of seal those buds to slow down the amount of air or evaporation off of them, you can retain a little more terpene. So usually dry trimming is best, unless, like I said, you're in a home environment to where wet trimming might allow you to dry at a more proper rate. That's the only time I would recommend. And on a side note, wet trimmed product looks really great for photography. So if you like to take pictures of it to show off for your Instagram, wet trimming is kind of a fun way to go. And then curing. Curing is kind of the last piece I wanted to get into on this episode. Talk to us about differences of curing home versus commercial. 
Okay. Again, um, when you're curing at home, a lot of times it's in glass jars or smaller bags, the, the chicken bags or the turkey bags at the biggest, depending on the size of your grow. And then you're more or less putting them in a closet, putting them in somewhere that's dark to keep them going. But a lot of times you're sitting at, at your room temperature or whatever, and you're just letting it finish up on its own. Again, you don't, uh, just like drying, you don't necessarily have a dedicated room for your curing stuff. Now in a facility, you have to have a dedicated room for your curing stuff because that is a finished product that is worth money. You need locks, you need security. You also need a room to be able to house it all. Also, it's not usually batched in small batches like that. Um, the majority of states, including Nevada, I know you can only test a batch that's five pounds or smaller. Above five pounds, you need a second test. So a lot of the times you're using uh, like five gallon buckets with sealable lids or uh, they make uh, larger turkey bags like the ostrich bags and stuff is the actual name of them on the Liberty bags that um, hold quite a bit more product and that way you can keep closer to like a three to five pound batch at a time test each batch individually before your product goes out. Whereas a home grower, you're not worried about testing batches and regulations. So you just match your container size to the size of your grow, put it in a closet, burp your jars every once in a while, you're good to go. In a larger facility, like I said, you're kept under lock and key and security. It's also usually a little bit cooler room, kind of like your dry room. You're going to want it 60, 65 degrees. So that way everything stays with the moisture content you set it at. And you're using larger containers to actually cure and finish that up to about a five pound point in most states. Yeah, I was going to mention that the temperature control that happens during curing and typically in home grows, I mean, a lot of people don't really care about the temperature, at least from my experience, a lot of people don't really care about storing in a specific temperature, it's just room temperature. And if their temperature increases, yeah. you know, like I live in the desert. I have some home grow jars right next to me right now yeah. in this room and I'm in regular air temperature and you know, it's just personal home growth. So. Yeah, so it doesn't really matter to a lot of folks. However, one thing to, to keep in mind that if you're not in a temperature controlled, if you're, you know, if you're sitting at 75, 80 plus degrees, you could be losing those terpenes, right? You, you probably are losing those terpenes. I was gifted one of those wine fridges. It's where I control the temperature. It's much easier to conserve those terpenes when it's, you know, under a right temperature controlled area, you know? Yes. Okay, so we went over a lot here. Taking a step back and just giving some general advice to the folks listening. You know, what advice do you have for those looking to make that transition from home growing to commercial growing? Okay, I do. I have a couple pieces uh, of advice for you, honestly. Um, number one, and this is obviously depending on on who's in charge of the hiring and cultivation, but don't brag about your home grow. That's one of the number one things you can do to kind of screw yourself out of a job. If they know you have an active home grow going at that guarantee, at that time and you're producing a lot, they look at that for a couple different negative reasons. One, you could possibly bring in pests that are can are that are specific to medical plants to that facility. And they don't want that increased risk at all. And that can help you hit a glass ceiling even if you are the most qualified candidate. Um, on top of that, there's also try to work towards your formal education. Like I said, it's not the same marketplace it was 10 years ago. You really need to have some formal horticulture education in order to progress through the tiers at these, at these facilities. Um, so I, I highly recommend going back to school, learning what you can about horticulture. I also highly recommend mentioning you have experience you you mentioned that you're good with horticulture you may even mention that you've had a home grow do not brag on your home grow that can be a problem and put you in a glass ceiling so watch out for for those mistakes and then also work towards your formal education so that way they know you're serious about horticulture in general and that can increase your chances and look good amongst the those that are looking to employ you Lots of good information there for those looking to make that transition from home growing to actually working in a cultivation facility. So wrapping things up, how can the listeners find you and what do you have upcoming in the future? 
All right. Well, uh, you can find me mainly. I'm more active on Instagram now, NV Closet Med Grower. I also have quite a bit of old material on YouTube that you can look through, like 400 some videos, many of which is very educational, some of which is just video logs of my gardens. But uh, you can check me out on YouTube, NV Closet Med Grower. I also have a website, nvcmg.com, where I sell some horticulture lighting and videos there. And uh, for the future, I'm actually in the process of moving to Tennessee to a hemp production facility. I just recently got signed a, signed an employment agreement to start next month in eastern Tennessee up in Appalachia, helping them grow a bunch of CBD-based hemp. So that's my next task is moving to the East Coast. To this, I'm kind of excited for the opportunity, and it's a it's a pretty decent small to mid-sized commercial facility running horticulture lighting group lighting and and you know it's it should be a fun experience for me so that's my next task is commercial management of premium indoor cbd hemp that's awesome man. i'm really excited for you it sounds like a great opportunity for you for sure so i'll definitely have a link to nv's uh, instagram and youtube down in the youtube description section below for those of you tuning in on youtube if you're on one of the podcast platforms just search for them You'll find them. It'll pop up. If you enjoyed this episode, click that thumbs up button. Also, subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Every single week, I am releasing these Garden Talk podcast episodes, and I would love for you to listen to future episodes. NV, thanks so much for coming on to this podcast today. This has been awesome. A lot of great information for those that are looking to transition from uh, you know home growing to the commercial side of things. Um, you definitely revealed a ton of good information that's going to help people on their journey there. So. Thanks so much to everybody tuning in. Thank you so much. And we will catch you in the next episode. Peace.